or something like that. Um, but we're hopefully we're we're going to uh, complete the fall feasts uh, or the spring feasts uh, today. Uh, what I told you is that there are the spring feasts, the fall feasts. Fall, there are three feasts. They begin with um, uh, what's that feast called? <laughs> Rosh Hashanah, uh, and that's the feast of trumpets. And then after the feast of trumpets. We have the High Holy Day, which is what what's it called? Yeah. Yom Kippur. Uh, and then final is the Feast of Tabernacles. So uh, we will do that closer to the fall. So here's what's going to happen. Um, Bart is going to teach Joshua after this. Uh, and then we'll go from Joshua back to the fall feast. Um, and then we'll go to Judges. And uh, I haven't told him yet, but I'm going to ask John to teach Judges. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, next, next week. <laughs> uh, so I've been teaching on Jesus and the feast. And, 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 and the great thing about this is that, that as you look at these feasts, you can see how Jesus was involved in fulfilling each one of them. So much so it became so obvious that actually, um, the, someone in the Jewish population uh, changed and adjusted some of those dates. I'll get to that uh, in a few minutes. But uh, so, so today I want to I uh, talk a little bit about what we've covered so far. You can see up here on the chart uh, that this includes Passover. We covered Passover. Jesus is our Passover lamb. Uh, we covered unleavened bread. Jesus is our um, unleavened, sinless uh, offering. Um, Jesus is our first fruits. Uh, and first fruits is the uh, first day after the Shabbat, which is the regular Saturday Sabbath. Uh, so that's on Sunday, which is why first fruits is always on Sunday. And of course, that's our Easter. Jesus is the first fruits resurrected, promising what? What is the first fruits promise? Yeah, there's more to come. There'll be more to come. And so there will be more that who will be resurrected from the grave. Uh, and then finally, now we moved into uh, last week, we started uh, Pentecost. And so we'll continue on that today. Uh, last week, we covered four areas, the names of Pentecost, the observance of Pentecost, the promises of Pentecost and the fulfillment. And of course, there were sub subjects underneath that. Uh, but that's what we've covered so far. So today, we're going to cover uh, uh, three topics. And, and I think it's important to take a look at all of this focusing on the fulfillment of Pentecost. We're going to take a look at some differences and similarities in, in, in between Pentecost, uh, God's Old Testament versus New Testament fulfillment, uh, the mysterious power revealed uh, on the Feast of Weeks in Pentecost, and then finally, the confirmation of fulfillment by Jesus and the Holy Spirit of the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost or Shabbat. There are, as we said last week, several names associated with this. And, and while the names are different, uh, and I'm talking about differences and similarities. Well, the names are differences. The feast is still the same. Uh, and it still does uh, several things. Uh, there's really a difference in, in the kind of empowerment. And, and under the law, they had very little power to overcome sin, didn't they? Very little power. So how did they, how did they even satisfy uh, and, and, and get any kind of temporary atonement? under the law the through, through a series of sin and Carol Ann, that's right sacrifices and they were arduous sacrifice they had to do them over and over and over and over again and God had a purpose in that what was God's purpose in that huh? not only to remember him but but what else what was God teaching them as as they were trying to fulfill the law and follow the law and fulfill all these sacrifices. That it was that they can't. The, under their power. Terry? That they can't. That they can't do it. They can't do it. And so and so they needed, they needed basically they needed a savior. They needed somebody to fulfill it permanently. And, and under grace and the Holy Spirit's guidance, uh, now there is immense freedom and immense power. Uh, Jack, can you read Romans 8, uh, 1 through 4? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit set me free from the law of sin and death, for what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, 
God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemns sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. So, so, so really the Holy Spirit came to us first on Pentecost, okay? The first Pentecost when the disciples were all gathered in the upper room. And, and, and they were, the disciples, just like there was a first fruits uh, feast of the barley harvest, who was the first fruit offering of the barley harvest? Who was, who was Jesus, okay? Jesus, our, our resurrected savior, okay? Well, there was also a first fruits of the wheat harvest. And that was the disciples when the Holy Spirit came to them, all right? So if you take a look at this, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Absolutely. That's about salvation. Our Passover lamb took care of that, right? And Jesus is our Passover lamb. Um, uh, and so those who are in Christ Jesus do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. What does that mean, that those who are in Christ Jesus walk according to the spirit? We're led by the Holy Spirit. He, he lives in us. The Holy Spirit lives in us. He leads us. He directs us. Can we ignore his direction? Yes. Yeah. Yes, but to our own peril. No question about that. I mean, not that I want to scare people, but God does discipline us when he continues to lead us in a certain direction and we ignore it. It's like that creative process that I talked to you about, and it starts in Genesis, where the spirit moved. Remember that? The spirit moves, and God spoke, and light came, and God separated light from the darkness. Okay, well, that's God's creative process, where he's creating creating a new earth, or he's creating a new soul. Holy Spirit speaks to us in some way. In my way, the Holy Spirit spoke to me through my mother-in-law who said, Leonard, this is what Jesus is all about. And of course, she had a captive audience. Uh, <laughs> uh, I had to listen to her because she wasn't my mother-in-law yet at that time. But she told me not only would you come on in if you want to. Uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, any, see any glasses anywhere? Fair <laughs> glasses. Oh, uh, that's right so so the spirit moves in you somehow sometimes it'll be somebody who speaks to you sometimes it could be something you read doesn't make any difference the spirit begins to move and you're unsettled and then god speaks to you and he speaks to you through those people and then light came you're enlightened and god then begins the process of separating light from darkness what is that process called sanctification okay and that's what they're talking about here in romans 8 there is now no condemnation of those in christ jesus so a lot of times we we doubt whether or not we're saved or not that's settled that's done there's no condemnation for those who are in christ jesus who walk people who walk according to the spirit and not the law for what the law couldn't do and some translations say weak as it was god did Okay. <laughs> okay. We got enough distractions. <laughs> all right. We all we got all we got all that covered. That's good. Anyway, well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go there anymore. But this, the Holy Spirit is a gift that God gives. You know, I, I was thinking about this. I've used this analogy before, but in um, in Lord of the Rings, there's a scene uh, where they're walking, and of course, um, um, uh, what does uh, Bilbo give to Frodo? Right. Gives a ring. Gives him a ring, but gives him something else. He gives him his, his book that he's been writing. Yeah. And he gives yes. him his mithril vest. Yeah. yeah. Gives him a vest of mithril. Yeah. Okay. And so, so as they're on their journey, one of the people says, and I can't remember which one it was because the names are escaping me now, but, 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 but he said, you know, I have heard, and they were talking about Mithril. Mithril was the most valuable thing in all the land. I have heard 
that Bilbo had an entire code of Mithril. And they said, no. Why, if, if he had an entire code of Mithril, whoever has that could, could really rule the Shire, right? Okay. And, and, I, and I keep thinking about this. I keep thinking about this in relation to the Holy Spirit. This is the, this is the power that raised Jesus from the dead, that caused people to speak in tongues, multiple languages. As a matter of fact, uh, they indicated that every language in the world was probably heard at that time during Pentecost. This is the spirit of power that we have with us. Okay, and, and we, we kind of say, oh, yeah, and, and I got the Holy Spirit. Uh, and how about those cubs? You know, we miss the point, don't we? We miss the point. There is, there is a power source that God has given us, and, and, and that power source is something that we can act on and oftentimes neglect. So, 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 so that's what we're talking about here. And, and really, uh, there, so there are some differences and similarities in the fulfillment of Shabbat or Pentecost or weeks, or the Feast of 50 Days. By the way, Pentecost comes from the Greek, and, and Pentecost Day, uh, that reminds me of my big fat Greek wedding. Uh, remember that? You know, everything comes from the Greek, right? Uh, uh, but initially it means 50th. And, and in Hebrew, Shabbat literally means seven, and Shabbat refers to seven weeks waiting from first fruits to Pentecost. So, so there was a waiting period. There was a timing, a waiting period. They waited seven weeks, 49 days and one. And Pentecost is called the Feast of Weeks or sometimes the Feast of 50 Days. So that's what we're dealing with. There are some similarities, but there are some differences. So, so let's take a look at Shabbat. Now, what's interesting about it is that God told them that they were supposed to make an offering of their harvest, the wheat harvest. And, and God, what God said to them is offer a first fruits of that harvest. Well, guess what happened? They lost their land. So now what did they do? They lost their land. There's no harvest. And as a matter of fact, when they went to other lands, Jews were persecuted and weren't allowed to own land. So, so what did they do? Well, they, they, they focused instead on receiving the law on Shavuot. Now, nothing indicates that this is exactly when they received the law. Now, there's supportive evidence and, and much supportive evidence. So we'll go over some of that evidence. But, but there's also plenty who discredit it as well. So, so, so God may have given them the law on Shabbat. We don't know for sure. But, I, but I'm going to kind of go with this because I believe God gave Pentecost in weeks for a different reason. Not only that he could have done it on that day, but he did it for a different reason. Now, God, consider that God gave them first fruits before they had land. So he gave them the order. I want you to celebrate first fruits. I want, to, I want you to offer your first fruits to the barley feast. I want you to, or barley harvest. I want you to offer a first fruits um, of the wheat harvest. And, and this is before they had land, okay? Well, what does that tell you about God? God is telling them this is gonna happen and it's gonna happen. They have a promise that they can put down, okay? So, so that's gonna happen. And God gave them Pentecost before they had land. But what's interesting about it is they still miss that point today. They missed the point. Jack, can you read that quote up there? Among less Orthodox Jews, Pentecost doesn't yield as much attention as some of the other Jewish holidays. Although the Bible names the Feast of Pentecost as a solemn feast, it may seem to some like the poor stepchild of all the Jewish holidays. It is one of the top three Jewish holidays, as indicated by the fact that it is a required special trip to Jerusalem, yet it remains the least understood and the least celebrated of them all. The least understood and the least celebrated of all. And yet, it was a pilgrimage feast. There were three pilgrimage feasts. What were they? Passover was one. What else? Pentecost was the second. And what's the third one? Hmm? No? No. Tabernacles, okay? So Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles were, were, were celebrations. They were, they were high Sabbaths. Uh, they were things that required uh, all the males to go to Jerusalem. And yet, 
It's ignored. As a matter of fact, I looked at some calendars, Jewish calendars, for the for the dates of Passover. And the other. By the way, Passover is is uh, is the 27th and 28th. So sun sun sundown on the 27th to sunset on the 28th, and then of course unleavened bread is what day? Sundown on the 28th to sunset on the 29th, um, and so that's this year. But I was looking for Shavuot or Pentecost. It wasn't on the calendar. It's not even celebrated in some Jewish sectors. Now, in Orthodox Jews, they do celebrate it, but they celebrate it lightly. Okay? Why is that? Well, number one, there is no land to celebrate the feast until recently. Mari. I was just going to comment. Why is it the church doesn't celebrate Pentecost? That's a big deal, I'm thinking. Well, I have to say that in the Catholic Church, I remember we did celebrate Pentecost Sunday. Okay. But why don't the Protestant, why does the Protestant Church celebrate Pentecost? That ought to be a great celebration. Because that's when God sent us a counselor, a comforter, an advocate, power. Okay. And yet we don't celebrate it. Okay. So, so uh, effectively, this was a promise that a greater harvest was coming, Christ's resurrection and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And both first fruits celebrations held promises for the future. Now, now, one of the things that's really important here is that th there are different reasons from why Christians celebrate. But there are also New Testament similarities. The law, think about this, the law was given to them to teach them. Wasn't it? God wanted a holy people. God wanted them to live holy lives. And God gave them the law to help them to do that. And they became a nation under the law. As a matter of fact, really, they didn't have any codified law until Mount Sinai. And Mount Sinai is when they really became a nation under the law. But then what happened? They violated the law and what happened? 3,000 people died, okay? 3,000, 3,000 people died, 3,000 people died. Now keep that number in your head because it's gonna emerge again. 3,000 people died. And what's interesting here is that giving a law was a result of a promise that God made to Moses and God made to the people. Exodus 19, three through six, Jack. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Now in verse six, holy nation there is an interesting word. The word used for it is kadash, and it means separate and distinct. And God wanted them to be a separate and distinct people. He wanted them to live lives that were separate and distinct from the world. And guess what? He wants the same for us. Uh, can you read First Peter uh, 2, 9 through 12, Jack? But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that uh, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. When you read this verse, what does it say to you? What does it say to you? Is it just a verse that you read when you're going through the Bible and oh, we're at first we're at first Peter? Okay, here's verse, here's chapter two of now verse nine, ten, eleven. All right, let's get. What's it saying to you, Jay? I mean, tell us we need to set an example 
brother to see as Christians, we can't say one thing and do another. We have to be living, living the world. And, and why is that? We are special. Okay, there you go. <laughs> we are special. We are a chosen people. You know, God didn't have to choose any of us, but he did. He chose to choose us. Do you understand the implications of that? Go ahead, Mari, I'm sorry. No, no, that's it. God chose us. You are a chosen people. And guess what else? You are a royal priesthood. In other words, what do you say? We don't need priests. You are a royal priesthood. The priesthood of the believer, right? You got that? Alvin. Throughout the Old Testament, time and time again, he reminded Israel that they were his. They bore, they bore his name. That's the reason why he punished them more severely. And that's the reason why he continued to bless them even when they failed. And he says that very thing here in this verse. You are, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Do you believe that? Now, I never thought I was anybody's special possession. Okay, as a matter of fact, there were plenty, plenty of nuns who told me differently. But uh, God's special possession. What do you think about that? I, I mean, if we weren't supposed to be humble, you could walk around kind of as a prideful. I am a chosen person. I am a, I'm a royal priesthood. And I'm part of a holy nation that is God's special possession. Alvin. Which also means that our significance as Christians must never come from what the world's significance comes from. That's right. But this is something to... to, to Far more important than any other... Absolutely. And because of this, back to Jay's point, because of this, what does he do? He urges us as foreigners and as exiles... Okay. In other words, this is not our home. We have a place that God has prepared for us. Okay. And, and, and so what he's saying is to abstain from sinful desires, which wage war against your soul. He said, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. See, that's kind of what Kyle's challenge is lately, isn't it? it is, to, to, is to be about doing good deeds and affecting people. Now, I'm not talking about being a social justice warrior. I'm talking about serving God in a way that makes sense and is obvious to other people. Because if we're just kind of interacting among ourselves and not doing anything out in the community, we're preaching to the choir. God has more important things for us. Well, I can preach on this the whole class, but let me move on. God gave the Holy Spirit, and I think it's important. Uh, he gave it to us in the New Testament on Pentecost. Why did he give it to us? Think about this. He gave it to us to guide and teach us. Does that sound similar to the Old Testament? That's what he intended for the law, didn't he? To, to make us a holy people, that's what he intended for the law and to help us live separate and distinct from the world. That's what God wanted for them there. So, so this is much like he did with the Old Testament law. He gave us the Holy Spirit to effectively do a much better job of that. All right, so sending the Holy Spirit was a result of a promise Jesus made earlier as well. So, so God made a promise to Moses, but Jesus also made a promise to his disciples. Can you read that from John 15, uh, 26 through 16, one, Jack? When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. So, so, so God wanted his disciples to go out and testify about him but he was going to empower them to do that. And, and the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost are about God's gifts to his people, but they're not just gifts for that individual to enjoy and use. They're, they're, they're that, but they're enjoy. They're also gifts given to his people so that they go out and testify about him. And, and, and if you think about that in the Old Testament, it's about gifts of his law 
to teach and guide them. In the New Testament, it's about the gift of his spirit to teach and guide them. So you see the similarities there? And in the entire Old Testament, New Testament, God is teaching and guiding his people to be holy and to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. To walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. So there are differences, but there are also similarities. And, and, and the fact that if God promised it, it's going to happen, is it not? Amen. So in the Old Testament and New Testament, God promised and then delivered. Is that a surprise? <laughs> See, the interpretations were different. But the purposes were the same. And actually, one led to another. Let's go back to Romans here. Uh, through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. That should be a jump up and down exciting statement. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did. God did. Not we did. We're not justified by our works. Paul said that in, in Ephesians. It's by grace you've been saved through faith. And this not of works, lest any man boast. So we have no reason to boast, but God was gracious to us. So, so let me just ask you a question. Were God's promises just for Old Testament and New Testament Israel? Were they? No, no, no. No. So, so, so God's promises were for all of us, and God's promises are to be our pleas in prayer. What does that mean? God's promises are supposed to be our pleas in prayer. We seek his word in prayer. What's that? We seek his word and seek his promises in prayer. We speak his word and we speak his promises in prayer. How many of you, when you pray, remind God of his promises? Amen. Amen. Okay. God, you said this. I need this. I, that, that's kind of a bold prayer, isn't it? God, you said this. I need you to do this. Okay. Is there anything wrong with that prayer? What does God tell us about approaching his throne? Boldly. He tells us to approach his throne boldly and hold him to his word. Listen to what uh, Spurgeon said. Can you read this, Jack? The best praying man is the man who is most believingly familiar with the promises of God. After all, prayer is nothing but taking God's promises to him and saying to him, do as thou hast said. Prayer is the promise utilized. A prayer which is not based on a promise has no true foundation. A prayer not based on a promise has no true. Isn't that interesting? A prayer not based on a promise. And so if you're not praying God's promises, you're not putting his promises before him. It's important to do that, isn't it not? It's, it's, it's important to do that. So, so we talked a little bit about some of the similarities and some of the difference between the Old Testament and New Testament. I think secondly, what I want to do is spend some time looking at the supernatural power at Shabbat or at Pentecost. And, and this is important because Pentecost really is a turning point. Before this, the apostles were just kind of followers. They helped in ministry. They did some things, but without him, without his power, they were somewhat aimless and afraid. As a matter of fact, before the resurrection or before they knew about the resurrection, what were they doing? They were hiding, right? They were afraid that they were going to come after them as well. But once they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they were supernaturally empowered and they became evangelistic. Did they not? And not only were they evangelistic, they were aggressive, which is interesting. See, God gave them the Holy Spirit. Peter preached to thousands, and guess how many were saved that day? 3,000. Does that sound, that number 3,000 sound familiar? Now let's read 2 Corinthians 3, 4 through 6. Jack? Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. 
Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. The letter kills, the spirit gives life. Some, some translations say the law kills, but the spirit gives life. Why does the law kill? It condemns us. It absolutely condemns us, and it's absolutely impossible for us to fulfill. But guess what? God knew that, so he sent Jesus to fulfill the law on us <laughs> and, and fulfill the law for us. Consider uh, uh, some interesting parallels. Supernatural signs and wonders occur as the law was given. Uh, Exodus 20, 18, 19, Jack. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. So, so there was thunder, there was lightning, there was a loud trumpet. And by the way, when we do Rosh Hashanah, I'm going to try and remember to bring my shofar in. What's a shofar? Anybody know what a shofar is? A ram's horn. I got a big ram's horn from Israel, uh, and I even learned how to blow it. Uh, but, but, but there was all of this commotion, and the mountains covered with smoke. And actually, the Hebrew translation, actually the early Hebrew, says that they saw voices and torches. Okay? Now, later, Moses reminds them in several places about this incident. In Deuteronomy 4.33, what does he say here? He says, has any other people heard the voice of God speaking out of fire as you have and lived? Well, that's, that's kind of an awesome challenge, is it not? An awesome challenge. And, and so that was intended to change the world, but the real day... And it did to some extent, but the real day that the world changed was at Pentecost. And, 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 and the spirit released supernatural power. But again, some folks don't get it. Rabbi Moshe Weissman said this. Jack, did you read that? On the occasion of the giving of the Torah, the children of Israel not only heard the Lord's voice, but actually saw the sound waves as they emerged from the Lord's mouth. They visualized them as a fiery substance. Each commandment that left the Lord's mouth traveled around the entire camp and, came, and then came back to every Jew individually. Now, how do you think most people would respond today if they witnessed something like this? How do you think people would respond? <laughs> <laughs> they might say it with special effects. But if, but if you're there in that presence, I think you're going to know it's not special effects. You're going to fall on your face before him. You fall on your face before him. Why? That's the weight of his glory. Now, we're going to come to that in a minute, but, but God is revealing his glory. He's flexing up there a little bit. And, and, and he's showing them his power and his glory and his majesty. So much so that the Jews were afraid. They're absolutely afraid to go near him. Uh, and you'll see later on that they, they, they didn't even want to talk to him. They wanted Moses to talk to him. Moses, you go talk to him, but, and you tell us what he says, but I don't want to hear it directly from him. They were afraid. It shook them to the core. Has God ever shaken you to the core? There I go again. There I go again. Has God ever shaken you to the core in anything? I mean, really shaken you to the core. Nothing. I'm getting nothing here. Nothing like that. <laughs> he has shaken me to the core. I told you when when I had my accident, I almost died. I actually came into God's presence, and it wasn't it, it wasn't anything other than on my part shame. And I was I was on the ground in the presence of His glory, and it was a. It was not, it was a scary place. And, and I think we sometimes take God for granted because his glory is powerful. And he is a holy God, a pure God, a mighty God. 
and we haven't seen one inch of it, much of it at all in our lives yet, but we will. Glenn. I was going to say, uh, I think many of us in here have uh, come to that point where we run out of our resources and we realize we have to depend on him and we come to the end of ourselves and depend on him. The silence might be because it's a little bit hard to go back there. It could be a little painful for a lot of people, I would think. Uh, I know I've certainly experienced that in my life, and uh, it's humbling, uh, to say the least. Um, but it's a good purging process to go through. Uh, Gigi feels, Gigi said, Gigi used to say that, that God was fast forwarding my sanctification. I'm not sure what he was doing, but it was, it, it was, it was certainly a humbling experience, that's for sure. But, but the Shabbat ceremony is actually a wedding, which is interesting. I was listening, reading from Rabbi, uh, he's a Messianic rabbi, Tom Lancaster, and he explained. Jack, can you read this? On Pentecost in the synagogue today, a wedding contract between God and Israel is read. The actual Torah scroll is dressed in white like a bride's gown. The whole congregation recites the Ten Commandments together. The story of Exodus 19 and 20 is read aloud to the congregation. Pentecost is celebrated as a wedding anniversary for God and his bride, the anniversary of the fire on the mountain when God's voice spoke to all languages, spoke in all languages of the world and was visible as torches of fire that came to every Jew individually. What does that remind you of? Anything? Revelation 19. What's in Revelation 19? Oh, Marriage Supper of the Lamb. Marriage Supper of the Lamb. Okay, that's what it reminds me of. Well, let's move on. So, so God revealed the supernatural power and the Jews were greatly afraid. As I said earlier, they wanted Moses to talk to them, but not God. And God's presence was so overpowering that they thought they'd die. Can you imagine that? Being in God's presence and thinking you're going to die. And, and, and I tell you, they felt the heaviness of God's glory, the weight of his glory. And that's, by the way, with smoke covering the mountain, okay? Smoke was, and they didn't even see all of God's glory. So let's go to Acts. And, and the disciples are gathered in the upper room. Now, now, what happens here is a result of a promise, again, that Jesus made earlier. Now, let's look at that promise. Acts 1, 4 and 5, and then verse 8, Jack. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So, so God really made this promise that they would receive the Holy Spirit. And Acts 2, 1 through 8, we see fire, which is often associated with wrath. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire coming on their heads. And, and they hear a sound like the blowing of a wind. And it filled the entire house. And I'm sure made noise both in the house and outside the house, because that's what God's word and God's presence spoken by God does but i wonder why is the holy spirit why is the holy spirit associated with fire and i wonder about that and then i found this by charles ryrie anybody know who uh, dr ryrie is charles ryrie an esteemed theologian um uh, was a professor at baptist or at uh, uh dallas baptist uh seminary but here's what he said uh jack can you read this Fire is a wonderful picture of work of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is like a fire in at least three ways. He brings God's presence, God's passion, and God's purity. The Holy Spirit is the presence of God as he indwells the heart of the believer. In the Old Testament, God showed his presence by overspreading the tabernacle with fire. This fiery presence provided light and guidance. In the New Testament, God guides and comforts his children with the Holy Spirit dwelling in our bodies, the tabernacle, and the temple of the living God. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit creates the passion of God in our hearts. After the two traveling disciples talk with the resurrected Jesus, they describe their hearts as 
burning within us. After the apostles receive the, whole, the Spirit at Pentecost, they have a passion that impels them to speak the word of God boldly. The Holy Spirit produces the purity of God in our lives. God's purpose is to purify us, and the Holy Spirit is the agent of sanctification. As the silversmith purges the dross from the precious metal, so God uses the Spirit to remove our sin. He, his fire cleanses and refines and by the way, where were those disciples uh, when when God spoke to them, when God taught them, when God revealed himself to them? The road to Emmaus. They were on the road to Emmaus. Ergo, the Emmaus class. But, but there are several verses also. You know, Ryrie talks about uh, fire represents God's presence, God's promise, uh, God's passion, and God's purity. And, and if you think about God's presence, think about the burning bush. There are all kinds of incidences or God is also represented fire, but several verses in the fire, uh, in the Bible also indicate that fire purifies. Jack, can you read uh, Zechariah thirteen nine? This is just one of them. This third I will bring into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people, and they will say the Lord is our God. So, so fire is an example of God's wrath and God's judgment, but it's also an example uh, and can be used for God's presence, God's passion, and God's purity. And, and, and so really, uh, they begin to speak in other tongues, it says in verse 3, and the Holy Spirit came with fire, and in Acts 2, 6, observers have heard the same sound as others heard, and they heard them speaking in other languages. And again, several Old Testament and New Testament similarities, okay? Because they heard in languages as well in the Old Testament. What's interesting about this, is this a coincidence? Huh? Is this a coincidence? What do you think? No. Well, well, well most Jews knew of God's fiery voice at Mount Sinai. And there's a clear connection between the fire on Mount Sinai and the tongues of fire and axe. I don't think it's a coincidence. It's not a coincidence at all. There's an obvious connection here and, and a connection between the giving of the Torah and the giving of the spirit. In fact, Ezekiel kind of puts a bow on this in Ezekiel 36, verse 27, Jack. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So, so he, this is in the Old Testament, and yet God is saying that he's going to ultimately put his spirit in people. And he says that, by the way, in several places in the Old Testament as well. So, so we're talking about supernatural power. After Moses gives, receives God's law, he comes down and he finds a horrible sight. Exodus 32, uh, 19 through 21, Jack. When Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned, and he threw the tablets out of his hand, breaking them into pieces at the foot of the mountain. And he took the, the calf they had made and burned it in the fire. Then he ground it into powder, scattered it on the water, and made the Israelites drink it. He said to Aaron, what did these people do to you that you led them into such great sin? Needless to say, Moses is disturbed by this, is he not? So he stood at the entrance of the camp, and he challenged those who loved the Lord, those who followed the Lord, to come to him. And the Levites all came, and he told them to go forth and execute God's judgment, Exodus 32, 28. The Levites did as Moses commanded, and that day about 3,000 of the people died. 3,000 people died. The law kills. The spirit gives life. There's an obvious connection, but there are more connections. In Acts 2, Peter's preaching at Pentecost. And he's preaching the gospel, by the way. Acts 2, verse 36 through 39. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? 
Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And Peter's preaching the gospel here, is he not? And he's not beating around the bush, is he? I mean, he accuses them and tells them that they killed the Messiah. Acts 2.23, Jack. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. You, through wicked men, put him to death. I mean, do you, do you think there was a hush in the crowd? Huh? <laughs> I mean, is that not pretty bold? I mean, think about the contrast here. All of a sudden, he's hiding up in, and he's hiding up in the upper room, and, and and now he's preaching and accusing, among other things, the Pharisees and Sadducees of killing Jesus. And yet, what happened? Still, three thousand people responded. Acts two forty and forty one, Jack. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. The law kills and the spirit gives life. Is that a coincidence? Huh? Coincidence? All right, I have a chart here. This is for Bart. <laughs> actually, I have two charts in a row, Bart. But, but what's interesting here is, is it's actually a description if you want to take a picture of this, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but it's a picture of Jesus fulfilling the feasts. And you get an idea that Jesus was our Passover lamb. Jesus was our sinless unleavened bread. Jesus was our first fruits, and he rose from the grave as our first fruits and a promise of war to come. And, 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 and Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit came to empower us, to teach us, to be an advocate for us. So all of those things are found in Christ. And then we take a look at trumpets, the Day of Atonement and Tabernacles, which we'll study in the second half of our series. Uh, and, and those are yet to be fulfilled. And I'll talk to you about how those will be fulfilled. But then you take a look at this. Here's another one. I just put this on there because I liked it. Um, but, but, but if you take a look at Passover, Jesus, God's Lamb, fulfilled the promise of the feast and skipped down to Pentecost. Peace of Pentecost promises... Uh, and they were all fulfilled by Jesus Christ, who breathed his, his spirit, breathed the spirit and breathed it on his church through the Holy Spirit. Okay, because not only did the Holy Spirit come about them, but before the Holy Spirit came on them, what happened? Jesus breathed on them and breathed his Holy Spirit, scripture tells us. So, so to understand Pentecost. There are four reasons for believing that Jesus fulfilled the feast. Number one, the convergence of the dates. Number two, Jesus' post-resurrection teaching. Number three, his comments about himself. And finally, Peter's quote of Joel 2 and Pentecost. So let's go through this real quickly. First of all, let's take a look at the convergence of dates. Uh, and, and, and by the way, we're not talking about January, but I thought this calendar might be cute. Uh, but if you take a look at key dates, Jesus, our Passover lamb, was crucified and buried during Passover and unleavened bread. And I told you that, that in my opinion, from what I've read, he was probably uh, buried on um, Wednesday as opposed to Friday. Uh, but I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, I, what I wouldn't do, though, or what I would do is encourage you to study it yourself. Uh, because as Jonah was in the belly of a whale for three days and three nights, so will I be in the ground for three days and three nights. He was raised the following Sunday, which was first fruits. And then after the resurrection, Jesus appeared and breathed his Holy Spirit into them to equip them to tell others. John uh, 20, 19 through 22. On the evening of the, that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So, so, so the Holy Spirit, Jesus breathed on them. 
See, God, God sent Jesus to share the gospel and to bring eternal life, but he wanted more for believers. He wanted to, to, to actually bring heaven down to them. See, in, 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 in actually in, in the Old Testament, Moses had to go up to God and receive his word. But in the New Testament, God brought his son down and brought his Holy Spirit down. And we see that happen in Acts 2, 50 days after Jesus rose on the Feast of First Fruits. So it's fulfilled in the dates. Secondly, Jesus' post-resurrection teaching. And this is important. He did just as he prophesied. John 14, verse 12 and 15 uh, through 18. Uh, Jack, can you read those? I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Verse 15, if you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. All right, and then Jesus actually reinforced this after he rose. Luke 24, uh, 24 verses 44 through 49, Jack. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything so this is after he rose from the dead. Uh, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with the power from, the, from on high. What's he doing here? Again, he's teaching them and he's preparing them for what's going to come. Just like he prepares us for what's to come. And, and after that, he ascended. And 10 days later, the Holy Spirit came with power. Power for what? For what purpose? To testify about him. <laughs> to testify him, but also so they could do, he promised they would do even greater works than Jesus did. But that would require supernatural power i think sometimes we're afraid of the supernatural aren't we but god promised supernatural power thirdly jesus tells us that he's the fulfillment of the feast john 12 23 24 jack jesus replied the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified i tell you the truth unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies it remains only a single seed but if it dies it produces many seeds now, you have to accept, why do you use that analogy? I think it's because Jesus here is the human grain of wheat that, symbol, that, that symbolized him. And, and by the way, why use wheat? Is it a coincidence that this is around the time of the wheat harvest at Pentecost that he's talking? And, and 50 days from the Feast of first fruits to Pentecost, and 50 days from Jesus' resurrection until he sent the Holy Spirit. I think essentially there is, if you take a look at this, there is so much stuff here. I'm just scratching the surface on how much of this points to Jesus Christ. If you, you know, there are preachers today who say, well, we're past the Old Testament. The Old Testament is not relevant. You agree with that? No. No. That's a, that's a lie. It's an absolute lie. And, and, and really, quite frankly, they, they miss the point as well. Because you can, if you want to get the gospel, you can get it all throughout the Old Testament on a regular basis. Because as I read, the, people say, well, I don't like the Old Testament. God is a murderous guy. No, he's not. I have changed. Yeah, I was listening to Governor Cuomo the other day talking about, I don't know why God did this. God didn't do this. It's a result of sin. So, so I think what we've got to do is, is push back when people say things like that. When, when I don't care if it's Governor Coleman or, or President Biden, whoever says it. When we hear people say, God did this, God doesn't do that. 
That's not our God. And when I read the Old Testament, I read a God of grace and forgiveness and thanksgiving and empowerment. And, and that's why we study the Old Testament. That's why Bart's going to study Joshua. And now, now, fourthly, Peter's address on Pentecost, which was awesome, but in that address, he quotes Joel 2. And Peter talks about God pouring out his spirit, and yet there's coming another day when God will pour out his Holy Spirit in a larger way. Joel 2, verses 28 through 32, Jack. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Now, when God talks about pouring out his spirit, what do you think that means? When God talks about pouring out his spirit in the last days, when I pour out my spirit. What does that mean? I'm going to give a few people the Holy Spirit part. I would say that that is referring to the fact that there will be a huge wave of evangelism and people will come to Christ in the last days. And, and really, I'm talking about a huge wave of evangelism, and, and, and this is confirmed in 29 other places in Scripture. But I want to take a look at just one, and it, this is supported by Romans 11, by the way, uh, but take a look at Zechariah 12.10. Jack, can you read that? I love this verse. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. <coughs> they will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. So God is going to pour out his spirit on the house. What does that mean? I'm going to pour out my spirit on the house of David. What does that mean? All right. Well, on, on the Jews at the, uh, during the tribulation period at the end, they will recognize that he was their brethren, that he was the Messiah they crucified and, recognize him who they pierced they will look on him who they pierced and we can't get any clearer than that so so what do we learn from all this <clears throat> i i think first and foremost overall clearly god is in control and he has a plan amen amen i'm gonna plaster right now to you that's right well we learned first of all that jesus is our passover lamb in the Old Testament, we're saved by spreading the blood of the unblemished male lamb on the lentils and doorposts. In the New Testament, we're saved by putting the blood of the lamb on our hearts. And Jesus, no doubt, is our Passover lamb. As a result, we're justified before God, Romans 5, 9. We're redeemed and forgiven and have unmerited favor, Ephesians 1, 7. Uh, we're made spiritually alive, John 6, 53. I am at peace with God, Isaiah 53, 5, and I have power over the enemy, Revelation 6, 10. Now, I'm not going to go through each one of those verses, but you get some idea of the promises that exist in God's word. Secondly, they purged houses for leaven. And Jesus really, and I've said this before today, Jesus is our unleavened bread, our sinless unleavened bread. And unleavened bread is not about salvation, it's about sanctification. And Jesus is our sinless, unblemished offering who sanctifies us. And he calls us to purge our lives of sin. How do we do that? We walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. We yield ourselves to sanctification and purge sin from our lives. How many of you can see that over the years, sin has been purged from your life. Yeah. And, that, and that you're walking in a different spirit these days than you were when you were first saved. And hopefully that happens to all of us on a regular basis, on an ongoing basis. So Jesus is our unleavened bread. Now, what's interesting is we also learned that Jesus is the first fruits of many more to come. That's a promise that many more would come. Uh, and he was our spotless, sinless lamb. So Jesus rose from the dead. 
Jesus fulfilled his promise, but Jesus didn't want to leave it there. He wants us to be saved, but he also wants us to be sanctified. And he knows we can't get, her, get there alone, so he sent us his Holy Spirit in addition to dying on the cross and resi uh, rising and saving us. So, so Jesus is our unleavened bread. I think, take a look at this, and I think finally we learned that he sent his Holy Spirit on the Feast of Pentecost. And in sending his Holy Spirit, God actually fulfilled three promises. One, a promise to send them a helper and a counselor. Two, a promise to do greater works than Jesus did. And three, a promise to have life and have it more abundantly. So let me ask you, why don't more of us have the abundant life that God promised? Why aren't we living that abundant life? Jack, can you read this quote? And I think this is important for all of us to hear. Many Christians influenced by the individualism of American culture live, live as if the church is useful but unnecessary. As long as we have a personal relationship with God, everything else is secondary. But Pentecost illustrates the truth found throughout scripture. God's people are central to God's work. Pentecost gives us an opportunity to consider how we are living each day. Are we relying on the power of God's spirit? Are we an open channel for the spirit's gifts? Are we attentive to the guidance of the Holy Spirit? Is the fruit of the spirit growing in our lives? Most Christians live in the presence and power of the spirit, but only to an extent. We are limited by fear, sin, low expectations, our tendency to be distracted from God's work in us. Pentecost offers a chance to confess our failure, to live by the Spirit, and to ask the Lord to fill us afresh with his power. You see, Christians are meant to live and live fully in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. you believe that? And I heard this quote. It's a great quote. The Christian who neglects the Holy Spirit is like a lamp that's not plugged in. Isn't that great? Simple, but to the point. And if you take a look at this, the Holy Spirit helps us do what? Helps us confess that Jesus is Lord, 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Empowers us to serve God with supernatural power, 1 Corinthians 12. Here we go again. Excuse me. This thing keeps shutting off and going on and off. Uh, it's a direct correlation between me. Okay. All right, so... so uh, all right, and, and, and it binds us together as the body of Christ, and, and that's in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13. It helps us, the Holy Spirit helps us to pray, Romans 8, 26, and even intercedes for us with God, the Father, Romans 8, 27, and finally, but certainly not completely, the Holy Spirit guides, Galatians 5, 25, and helps us to live like Jesus, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. What do you think? What do you think? The next time I teach, I'm going to begin the fall feast. Bart's going to do um, um, Joshua coming up. But I have to tell you, um, I have really enjoyed preparing this series because this is the third time I've taught on the feasts. And I have to tell you that each time I've Taught on the feast, I've learned more and more and more. And it's not just about reading books. It's about studying God's word more deeply. And I want to encourage you and challenge you to do that. It is a rich reward. And I'll tell you, it's not just sitting here being hearers of the word, but then saying to God, okay, God, what do you want me to do with this? Where do you want me to go with this? How do you want me to use this? Not just here is the word, but do is the word. Alvin. I think much of the church has gotten the opinion that uh, we have to have teachers. Well, God wants us to have teachers, and God wants us to learn from teachers. But the Apostle John said in the first, his first epistle, As for you, the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as he has taught you, you abide in him. 
The Holy Spirit is enough. And many of us ignore the Holy Spirit entirely. And yet God tells us, for my God, Paul tells us in Philippians, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. But essentially, we've got to want them. We've got to desire them. We've got to pursue them. And God will richly bless us with that. Alvin, close us in prayer today.